Am I just not going to be in the way if I say that? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, your, your car. Your car is in the camera. Sorry, sorry, can you move that way, please? Oh, yeah. Can you go back? Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Your car is. Well, okay, I'll just move it here. Yes. yes. Sorry about yeah. that. <laughs> publisher of Press Bar Press, um, which is a relatively new press for Maltese uh, literature in English and English translation, which I founded with Kat Storace. Um, and this evening we're celebrating our first two publications, uh, Scintilla's New Maltese Writing 1, which is an annual anthology um, of New Maltese writing um, originally written in English or translated from Maltese into English. And uh, Lorraine Bella, who is here this evening, we have uh, her short story collection, What Will It Take For Me To Leave, which was translated by Kat. Um, so I'm going to introduce our three speakers. Uh, we're going to be talking and reading for about 45 minutes and then we'll open for questions. So if you think of anything on the way, uh, make a note of it. <laughs> and we'll have time at the end uh, to discuss. Um, so introductions. Uh, Peter Scalpello is a queer poet and therapist from Glasgow. Their work has appeared in Five Dials, Granta and the London Magazine. Their debut poetry collection, Limbic, which is, which is here, is published by Cypher Press. Kat <laughs> uh, Starache is a writer, literary translator from Maltese and editor. She is the translator of Lorraine Bellows, What Will It Take For Me To Leave? and is co-founder and co-publisher at Press Bar Press. And Lorraine Bella is an award-winning Maltese writer, translator and performer based in Brussels. Her short story collection, Limbibi and Jewa, was shortlisted for the National Book Prize of Malta and was published by Press Bar Press in English translation last year. Her novel, Rocket, won the National Book Prize of Malta in 2018 and has been published in Arabic translation. Her latest novel is Marta Marta and her latest translation is Brecht's Mother Courage. Um, so from German into Maltese. Um, so to kick us off, um, just a little bit of an introduction if you know nothing about Malta or Maltese. Um, Malta is the largest of three islands in the Maltese archipelago. So we have Malta, Gozo and Camino. Uh, and Maltese as a language is a Sicilian Arabic dialect. Uh, but in Malta, because of Malta's colonial history, which up until its independence was very, yeah, coloured, <laughs> quite uh, busy. Uh, the, the final language that, that landed in Malta was English. So English is a co-language of Malta. So um, that is why you can have Maltese writers writing in English, um, but then writers which will discuss that solely write in Maltese. Um, yeah, to start with, I just wanted to ask if everybody could give a little context about what Malta and Maltese mean to you, just so everyone knows um, where where you sit with, with Malta and Maltese. So, Peter? What's up? Yeah. Um, hi everyone, I'm Peter Scalpello. Um, a bit of background about myself is that I am half Maltese. My dad is Maltese and I was raised in Scotland by a Scottish mother. Um, my relationship to my Maltese heritage is slightly complicated in that my dad isn't in my life and I don't have a connection with that side of the family. I know that they're there in Malta, but I don't have the, um, the connection, the, the cultural background to my life. So I've kind of been piecing that together myself, to be honest, with um, visits to Malta in my adulthood and a lot of reflecting and trying to kind of piece together what my identity means for me as a multi-Scottish person. Um, that's kind of my book. Should I speak about Press Bar Press or, yeah? yeah? Like, yeah. Um, when I saw the, the kind of, the, the call out for um, Press Bar's first anthology for, for writing by Maltese writers, 
Um, it was the first of its kind that I'd ever come across. I don't think I'd even come across literature written in Maltese or translate, you know, it, it wasn't something that I'd really come across and being someone who really loves literature in English translation, um, that was very exciting to me because it was kind of this enmeshment of um, a culture that I was already trying to kind of learn more about for myself as well as starting to write a first collection of poetry which is what I was doing at the time so a lot of thinking about my own identity, um, what it is that I wanted to write about and express of myself in that in that collection, um, so it seemed like a perfect opportunity to kind of trial out some of the um, linguistic elements of, of Maltese that I was kind of trying out at the time, as well as what it meant for me as a kind of absent identity almost, and um, uh, a bit of a kind of reaching for um, part of my life and in my writing, so that's kind of where I'm coming from. Amazing. Um, Laura. Uh, hi, thank you everyone. Um, so I lived in Malta up to 2005. Um, everything in, back to till that point was Maltese and English. But then I left, uh, I left the island to work in Luxembourg and then in Brussels as a Maltese translator. So um, it was only when I left Malta that I became, um, I started using the language much, much more because it was my working language. In Malta I was teaching, teaching uh, drama and, and English and we used to teach in English. So it felt uh, strange but also appropriate, this idea that uh, I'm leaving home but I'm taking with me as a working tool my own language, which is for me um, one of the most important aspects of um, my identity, the language. Um, it was also at that time that I started writing. So up to up to that point, I was doing theatre mostly in Malta. And um, once away from Malta, I started writing. I had less time for theatre, but more time for writing. And I wanted to write in Maltese, uh, writing stuff which is completely different to um, the documents, uh, legal documents that I was translating <laughs> into Maltese. So I realized that uh, I was learning a lot um, through translation. I was becoming even more familiar with my own language, uh, but I wanted to use it in a more creative way. And that is when I started writing. I, I started writing um, children's novels, uh, and eventually I wanted to move away from that. Um, uh, and Kat, what is your relationship with um, Malta and Maltese and then maybe um, also how how the idea for Praspa came about as well? Yeah, I mean they're very related to me, so, um, and I'm a bit of maybe the reverse of Moran. Um, so uh, I've been in the UK for eight years now, just over eight years. Um, my first language or chosen language even is English, so I've grown up speaking English. Um, Maltese is also a language that's been in my life since I was a child, but um, I would say I kind of, I write, I read, I speak, um, I dream in English. Um, and so um, what I found in terms of my relationship to the language, translation has been a really nice way for me to get back um, involved with Maltese. I feel the longer I've been away from Malta, the more English has taken over because my context means I don't use Maltese at all anymore, except when I speak to my parents um, and within my home, very close family context. Um, and it was, it's been just really nice to kind of connect with Maltese again and rediscover my my own or make my own connection with the language through um, through translation. So that's sort of about Maltese. And uh, another aspect, I guess, would be press which Jen sort of, um, has pointed to um, so the reason I and the reason the press sort of was a very important project to me was um, that I also worked in publishing so, so that's kind of been my career since I've been in the UK pretty much um, and I became increasingly sort of frustrated by the fact that 
um, though there's quite a thriving uh, literary scene in Malta, and Malta um, it's, it's mostly writing written in Maltese, like Laurent's writing, um, that isn't available in English, so I couldn't talk to my friends or my colleagues, or uh, there was no Maltese literature. I was working in literature, but I couldn't ever kind of recommend any writing to, to anybody, and I think this became, for me, uh, problem of visibility as well and kind of how to represent yourself um, and how I felt how I felt Maltese identity was represented in, in the UK even with my colleagues but then more broadly um, and so I was um, while I was working a book came onto my desk um, it was a book Jen had translated so I saw Jen's name um, it was Maltese um, I thought this this is a Maltese name um, so I looked Jen up and she was doing an event that evening and um, introduced myself and realised that Jen had the same concerns. Um, and so, yeah, um, we went for a drink and the rest is pretty much yeah, history. <laughs> um, um, so you were speaking really nicely there about how translation has reconnected mm -hmm. you with Maltese um, in maybe unexpected ways. but. What was it like working on a on your first translation? Because this is your first book mm -hmm. length translation. Um, what was you know? Did you have any reservations of taking on this project? And maybe what were some of the more tricky challenges of, of working with with this text? And also the pleasures as well, yeah. not necessarily just <laughs> the the yeah. thorny bits. <laughs> um, when I read when I read the book, um, Jen and I were looking for a book to to um, translate into not necessarily ourselves, but to, to publish basically a, a translation of the Morty's book into English. Um, I really sort of I fell in love with this writing. I've read Laurent's writing before in Maltese, but this book was yeah, it, it, it's I found it very intimate and it really spoke to me to a lot of my concerns and some of my anxieties as well that, that Laurent writes about. Um, the idea of translating it was incredibly daunting um, and wasn't something, I mean, initially it's just not something I've done before. Um, uh, and it's something I've been very interested in doing. Um, and after sort of having lots of conversations with Jen, I think um, I felt able to kind of overcome that initial sort of anxiety or stress about, about doing it. And was able to sort of look at um, this is a real a project that I really wanted to do, um, and so that's kind of um, that's kind of the first bit. Sorry, I remember the second part of your question, which is um, the, the challenges. I guess the challenges for me, um, I think, it's about not think, not believing that uh, your grasp of the original language is some, somehow feeling like an imposter in your own language, uh, which is Maltese for me, but, um, and how I might be able to do, sort of do justice, I guess, to Laurent's text, um, and overcoming that for me really was about the collaborative project that it, this translation became, so having um, Jen, sort of, all Jen's experience um, to, to kind of support me through that and to be you know to have someone I could ask questions to but also a brilliant editing process which I went through with Jen and then this amazing access to it sort of to Lauren and wonderful conversations that we had but then eventually made the book so that's the summer part. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Lauren you're a very experienced translator from many languages um, and you also read a number of languages and I was wondering does how does translation feed into your to your work and also the because you can read from so many languages do you find that you draw on the literature of other countries mm -hmm. that feeds into your own work i think this is something that uh, i became more aware of uh, when working on the last novel on marta marta because i wanted to um i wanted to tackle certain aspects mainly uh, feminism uh, f from uh, from the point of view of um, works written in French rather than works written in English um, not just from the UK but also from the US for example because I, I was feeling that um, uh, when it comes to certain 
things, um, aspects such as feminism, uh, Muntis people are more um, referring to uh, books written in English. So I wanted to give a different perspective. So I, I spent the last three years really reading French, French novels, um, French nonfiction, French theory, and I felt that the, the exercise was how to use all this reading in my writing in Maltese and that was a, that was part of a, a really interesting process I, I think I managed so I, I'm quite happy now that it's over I can I can feel that I'm, I'm very happy with, with the result but that was really a very important aspect of it so yes the, the different languages um, it is also because I, I spent many many years just reading Maltese uh, sorry reading English um, I, I wish I could spend so many years reading Maltese but there aren't that many there weren't that many before so uh, it, it was also we didn't have much choice I guess when I, when I was growing up um, it was very possible to access a, a quite a large number of books written in English but then very few books were written in Maltese um, but at some point I, I decided that I, be, because I can understand uh, Italian so well, I, I, I never studied Italian, but I can uh, speak it and I understand it really well, I guess. Uh, so I said, maybe I should start reading it. So a few years ago, I started reading Italian uh, literature. And then three years ago, I, I decided to just read French and to, to help me in, in my writing. So, and now it's the turn, uh, it's German, which I have to <laughs> really work on. Uh, <laughs> it, it was interesting because um, while working on Marta Marta, where uh, one character is based on Mother Courage by Brecht, it was at the same time that I got a, a, an email uh, from um, this com theatre company in Malta asking me uh, if I was interested in translating Brecht's Mother Courage from German into Maltese and they said, and it was in front of me <laughs> and I said, this is, this is amazing like, uh, uh, it's as if they knew so I, so I ex accepted immediately because I felt that it was going to help me in my writing so there was, a, there was a, also a bit of German there <laughs> So it's that translation as research Yes, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, Peter, your poem that is in the anthology, um, Salt Farming, you do incorporate Maltese um, into this poem. Could you tell us a little bit about um, yeah, what you were trying to do with this poem and, and the incorporation of Maltese and, yeah. and even the form, because it's got a really beautiful mm -hmm. form. Thanks. Yeah, I think the, the integration of the few words of Maltese that are in this poem um, was an intention from the outset, I think, how can I write into Maltese and how can I use the language to illustrate a kind of in-betweenness of identity and language, um, while also um, making sense and using the language correctly, because I, I don't speak Maltese, um, and just an interest of um, leaning into the the broader possibilities of language in general, I think. Um, the layout of it is uh, supposed to be kind of water and ripples of um, of, of water, um, which you beautifully typed set, which <laughs> I'm sure wasn't that easy. <coughs> Fairly straightforward, yeah. but um, yeah, and in kind of two columns that, that go down. Um, what I was trying to do with the poem, kind of coming back to this idea of a searching for an absence and identity um, was to reflect on the imagery of salt farming as it happens in Malta, um, the kind of bewildering spectacle of that and link it to a kind of pining and longing um, in myself and I think that was kind of the main intention for the poem to be honest, yeah it was part of a series of poems that I was writing kind of about Maltese specifically um, at the time and the only one that's been published so um, yeah that's that's this poem which I'll read yeah yeah, yeah. okay this is salt farming 
season. <clears throat> I'm sorry again. Season me like saying Lista Jun Li Lili the seasons to me a question for the sea's invisible taste residue of rock and light territory luminous I am contained within its prism speck and flash like land the weather forming seasons, which seasons a life, something surfacing. And in my search for clarity, not even I am present, confirmed as one thing, transient. When I too wither, what is left? Seeping saline without fear of withdrawal, Ocean, endless and estranged. Salt farming in Malta. I'm just a person and their tools, active with need, like salt farming is my sexuality, work. Puddle once a tide of wanting and wet kilos bored through for the single grain, that flake, like pulling out my own tooth, seems to confirm affinity, or what can be touched of it, sprinkled on my tongue and becoming self-rooted. Rub it right into the skin, particularly my shoulders and face, so indistinct in this paradise. I let it fill a fissure, bread of what lacks. As reduction magnifies our purest commonality, seasoned, of season, Easter June, me. Thank you. <laughs> um, is there anything in particular that you've been reading or that you do you have a favourite? I've been trying, well I have been reading uh, The Books of Jacob which is a translated work from the Polish by Olga Tokarczuk translated uh, by Jennifer Croft which is this magnificent huge novel it's like 900 pages long um, and it's fantastic but very long and <laughs> quite overwhelming um, but I love Olga Tkarczuk's work um, that's been translated into English relatively recently in the past three or four years I think but maybe four or five years um, I'll go with that for now <laughs> yeah. yeah I actually think we have it for sale here yeah we do, yeah. We do. <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> I'm not, but no, it, remind, it reminded me. Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend her. Um, and, and Kat, what were you reading growing up in Malta? Were you reading, um, I know you've got some favourite Maltese writers that were very influential to you, including Lorraine, of course. Um, you know, um, you interviewed Lorraine as well, didn't you, mm. as a student, maybe? In my first job. In your mm. first job. Mm. Um, so yeah, what were you reading growing up? Um, was it a mix of things... Was it also from French? Because you can also mm, read French. French. It's yeah. um, like Lorraine. Um, Maltese was it was a chore we did. Uh, we had to read. My, my mother would make us read some translations of things like the Ugly Duckling. Um, I remember um, in Maltese, and that was part of our kind of summer holiday reading um, because otherwise it was sort of school texts. But um, also in the summer holidays, there was a real I was really keen on this series, which is, I mentioned this because this is where Praspar, in a sense, comes from, um, but there were these series of Praspar to Tam Tam Modest, mm -hmm. um, Charles Asta, um, and they're essentially um, sort of mis the mishaps of this priest, <laughs> which, um, <laughs> um, but they were kind of these nice sort of short Not stories, um, which always had a kind of a, a mishap and then a resolution. And, um, 
uh, and those kind of stayed with me always. Um, but otherwise, I was reading reading a lot of um, uh, English books and classics. I was very much into reading the classics in my teens, especially. Then moved to Terry Pratchett and fantasy, sort of, um, latterly. Um, I came out of that with uh, yeah, I studied English, so there was a lot of that. Um, but in terms of Maltese writers, I think it was a lot of Maltese poetry really that really mm. stuck with me, particularly I always mention um, Maria Greg Ganado, mm -hmm. um, who is just wonderful. She writes in English and in Maltese, she translates her own work. Um, she's done a little bit of prose, but not that much. And, um, and I remember buying her first book, so, um, and that sort of sticking with me. And, I also might have the opportunity to, to interview her later on, and um, yeah, her works really stayed, stayed with me. And we're publishing. And we're we're in the next one. Yeah. Which um, is <laughs> amazing. Yeah, yeah so, and it, it feels lo um, long overdue for her. Um, she's kind of been writing, I think she's one of the few female writers who has actually um, been published and, and is kind of uh, well known. Um, within Malta itself and even internationally to an extent she's been widely translated. Um, so yeah, it's like a um, platform. Laurent, could you tell us a bit more about Nabi Bin Chawa and um, where you were in your writing life when you were working on it? Because mm -hmm. obviously you've published many novels now. Um, so yeah, these are obviously shorter pieces, vignettes, poems. Um, yeah, could you give us a little insight into that? Um, yes, yeah, so I usually write novels. So this is, if I'm not mistaken, the only collection of short stories. <laughs> no, I said. <laughs> yeah, this is the only collection of short stories um, uh, for me because I tend to, when I write, I write at length. I actually, I have a problem with writing shorter, shorter, shorter words. But um, this came at a time when I had just finished a very long novel for me. Uh, it, I say long, not because it's 400 pages long, but because it took me long to finish. Because when I started it, um, just a few months after I started working on it, I realized I was pregnant and so obviously things had to slow down and what was planned to take two years of writing took me four, four, four and a half years. Uh, which means that for these four and a half years I, I, I was stuck with these characters and it was very tiring so I finished it and I said okay the next project is going to be really the opposite, just short stories. And um, I wanted to also move away from the kind of writing I was writing at that time. I think with Rocket, um, I sort of concluded a phase where I was writing, I was very interested in, in writing about the future. So it's, uh, it, it can be, um, can fit in the genre of speculative fiction, Rocket I mean. Uh, I was interested in time travel, space travel, uh, fantasy up to that point. But I think I, I had had enough and I wanted to really move away and write sh very short stories uh, which are more intimate. So I, I started writing, so I gave myself this exercise. I wanted to, I, I, I told myself I have to write one story a day three pages, four pages maximum. Um, I, I begin and finish on the same day and no editing. And after a summer of this, um, I had this collection. Um, something about, uh, something which really helped me to, to manage to, to write it in one day, one story per day, is, um, is the fact that um, I not only got ideas from the, my surroundings. So if I go to a cafe, I look around me and get an idea from there and write it down. I also used um, aspects, elements, small elements uh, from my own life. So probably there's something about me in each story. 
but it could be really really small that you wouldn't really notice i would so when i read, when i encounter for example uh in one story um, which is called com there is a box a jewel box which i describe and that jewel box really exists it, it belonged to my mother uh, there is a table with a scratch on it and the table really exists um, and sometimes you know it's uh, <laughs> there is a um, in, in the story that I would like to read today there is someone who is um, closing the taps because uh, thinking of closing a tap to, to, to leave and that is my father because he was really obsessed with uh, what if there is a leak if we go out for a day or a week and we have to really close the taps really tightly <laughs> so these are elements so there's a lot of um, a lot of, there's a lot of these it, i wouldn't say it's an autobiographical collection not at all it's just these little elements which uh, i think um it could be that it's it's, it's this aspect that makes the re readers have spoken to me about their feelings uh, after reading these stories um, that they sort of felt that um, that they're credible so that they're, or, or that they're sincere maybe maybe it's this I, I don't know and would you like to read um, yes. the story now okay so Lauren will read uh, in Maltese and then Kat will read uh, her English translation Um, so, this story is called Bach, and Bach is the word that we would use when we're speaking to children to show that, that's, um, that something has disappeared, has vanished. So, it's like, uh, yeah, can you see this? Bach, it's no longer there. And um, it comes, so I can just give you a little backstory for this. Um, I was in a cafe, I wanted to write a story, I opened a newspaper there, there was something about Houdini and that was the title that I wrote down that day, but then eventually I, I didn't want to keep the title Houdini, so I decided to, to use this word. It's Bach, it means void and it's, it can be very scary. So I read the Maltese and I hope you enjoy the sounds. <laughs> Cats will translate. Bah. Shilit namel bishnitla. Aun minu umu yitla. E um felodu yilba sifta hendipu yohroch. Umerja shi jilura ek. Bla pian, bla teia. Yu for si hai tu kolla sada kil punt kinat fil fat. Teia bizayet bishim for slow rain. Ta bizlu u ya batu yitla ek. Hapta u safta. Nitla. Um halli kollox barajja, kollox kif inu. Jimmi nix it-tip li nqum u nitla, jien dak li namel li li jien innewden nitqallef, noruq bramel ara u nqum imkebbeb fli zara asra u jinten. Imbat inqatta jiem, lex, etnejt, ġima, tsħaħ, nizen u nkejjen u nqis, għabel niddeċidiħ pas paldan. Jekk flaħħar naqtaħħa li sanamela, jikolli nallu kazlin biex nitpakja nerfa u nsor, nifta hil-bibin u l-kxaxen u nbattalum. Nala il-viti tal-ilma il-kontijiet tal-bank u nimuħsib li man ħalli xejn nofs leħja warajja. Kemi sibijiet u pjanijiet tuħad li xxur deċizjoni bħaldin, biz-biz, il-ħsib diġaħir ibni. Muxta bxejn adnija u kif nistan umu nitla, niġina għawin um min dak kollu li nħalli warajja minix il-tip. Għadfadal nix naħmelaw, naħf, zmini għadu ma wasalx u naħf li biz-zejet li zmini għad nusi jasal jekk il-deċizjoni titħalla fidejja. Minix it-tip li ninqala min fejn jien, għax min jaf xem mistura li jada pitada se noħrab dal-post. Il-nizmin twil biz-zejjed biex inkun nistanej li lebda sena mi bħal-loħra. U li kul sena dejja mġabet maħħa xibaw xata, jew sorpriza xejn mistanija. Għalbin ħossat ħabba taktar maġla, meta jaddu li ħsibijiet bħal-dawn. Jien għaw sen ibqa, għalissa, le minix it-tip li nqum u netla. Imma jekk tibqa tħares lejja, ju fos loħrajn, għandek nejn tarani nejf. Okay, here's the translation. The title is Disappearing Act, and 
it's also the first line to the title um, of the book. So, what will it take for me to leave? Some people simply get up and go. They wake up one morning, get dressed, open the door and walk out. Never to return, just like that. Without a plan, without any preparation. Unless their entire lives up until that moment had all been preparation for when, on a day like any other, having reached the end of their tether, they decided to pack it all in, get up and leave. Just like that, out of the blue. Should I go and leave it all behind? Everything as it is? I'm not the get up and leave kind, uh, sorry, I'm not the get up and leave type. I'm the sort of person who spends their nights worrying, tossing and turning, and wakes up swaddled in sweat-soaked reeking sheets, and then spends days, no, entire weeks, weighing things up and making the necessary calculations before deciding on a move like this. If I do fix up on going in the end, I'll need to allocate the time to pack, sort, sort through everything and put it all away, open up the doors and drawers and empty them out, turn off the taps, close bank accounts, and take care not to leave anything behind half finished. So many thoughts and plans. It would take me months to prepare for a decision like that. I'm already overwhelmed just thinking about it. It's really no wonder I'm still here. How could I ever get up and go and turn my back on everything I'd leave behind? I'm just not the type. Anyway, I've got unfinished business over here. I'm certain my time hasn't come yet. And I know myself well enough to admit that my time will never come if the decision is left in my hands. I'm not the kind to uproot myself. Because who knows what's in store for me tomorrow, the day after, next year, in this place. I've been here long enough to be able to say with confidence that no two years are the same, and that every year has brought with it its own ordeal or surprise. My heartbeat quickens when I think these thoughts. I'll stay here for the time being. No, I'm just not the type to get up and leave. But if you fix your eyes on me, on a day like any other, there's a chance you'll watch me disappear. Yeah. <laughs> um, could you give us a little bit of uh, insight into the title of the book? Because obviously, well not obviously, Nadibu Jawa mm. doesn't mean what will it take for me to leave. And that mm. was a process. So mm. could you yeah, tell us a little bit about how we arrived at that title? Yeah. I think it's the hardest thing to translate um, for me, the expression of the Jawa, because it's got it's um so it literally means behind closed doors, maybe we can mm. say, is, is the kind of easiest, um, most literal. Like from the door, the door in. in. <laughs> but it, the door yeah. there means the front door of the house, the so house. it's really what happens at home. Exactly. And that's the real meaning, it's what happens kind of at home. So and this is a large part of the story, is it's kind of um, these kind of... Uh, <coughs> Things that happen either in somebody's inside somebody's head. Sometimes they're just thoughts, but they're all happening in closed spaces and really um, struggling to kind of um, be free of, of these kind of boundaries. And I think something that kept coming up for me and in, in discussion with Jen as well, reading the stories, was this idea of a threshold and kind of crossing a threshold. Um, so you're in one state and then. You Cross the threshold in, into another, and actually, the, for me, the structure of the of the entire book, I guess, the collection is is that way. You kind of, to me, there's this particular story almost marks a middle point um, where there's a kind of this. I don't want to leave, and actually, the stories that follow um, are almost a movement towards the final story, where, um, without any spoilers, that. The, the character sort of crosses the threshold, in a sense, or maybe not. Um, so, <laughs> so, so we 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 had the working title of thresholds for quite a long time. It looked very nice on the cover. It's a nice short title, easy to talk about, easy in emails as well. Um, but I think in discussion with Lauren, we started to realise that it was too generic and wasn't kind of quite describing the stories. Um, so we went back to the drawing um, board. And um, and then it felt quite 
this this line sort of jumped out at us. I think um, what jumped out, Jen, Jen and I were thinking about. It. We put forward a couple of proposals, but this felt like a really good um, title that, for me, really encapsulated the entire feeling of the book, which is an anxiety about change or an anxiety about kind of um, essentially leaving any anything in any form behind. Um, but also I do think that the book is quite hopeful and um, and so you get to decide, I think, at the end as a reader whether that's been successful or not, I guess, that emancipation of the answer. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, what's really interesting about your book, Lauren, um, is that it does feel like a journey even though there's these disparate um, stories that are very standalone, but there, there is an arc going on. and. I wanted to bring you back in, Peter, to ask about whether with your collection, Limbic, there is also a journey that is going on and, you know, how did you order your, your collection? Because ordering collections can be incredibly tricky. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the, the collection is split into three sections. There's, um, let me think, <laughs> there's um, Ego, Elegy and Ecstasy as three different sections. I think the the section titles and themes came after collating the poems, to be honest, and collating the poems that I felt I wanted to include in the collection. And I noticed that there was certain themes, potentially, that, that ran through um, chunks of the poems. So ego more to do with um, potentially, I think, overt sexuality and uh, individuality and um, a kind of struggle for self potentially. Um, elegy in its essence as a kind of um, reaching for remorseful section but also with some kind of irony there at what may on the surface seem kind of joyful and yet may lack joy in its essence. And then ecstasy as a kind of opposite to that, things that um, I write a lot about substance misuse in the book and I think that ecstasy as a, a state of queer joy potentially that is understruck by this pain or a filling of a void. Um, so trying to kind of play a little bit with the, the meaning of these sections um, and that then I think just became about ordering the flow and the rhythm of what I felt maybe could kind of juxtapose each other um, but also add to a sense of an arc potentially from the, the start to the end of the collection so that it almost reads like a bit of a journey um, which is interesting because I don't think it's something necessarily that is needed in a short story collection or in a poetry collection, this kind of arc or this narrative, you know, epiphany or what have you. But um, it did feel like as I was writing the collection that was happening for me actually. And that maybe is what felt was being mirrored in the structuring of the collection. So um, trying to illustrate those ups and downs in a way while kind of generalising themes as well mm -hmm. was the intention. And, and would you like to read one or two poems from Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's do it. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll read the last poem in the collection, which is in a similar vein to the, um, the poem in the Scintillas anthology, a kind of similar reaching for, searching for, a kind of absence in identity and a kind of pater paternal lack, um, and then I'll read something a bit lighter. Um, so this is Be Your Own. Your one seeing eye rises and sets, facing away from the mush of my twenties, a decade's worth of pills disintegrates into white particles in my blood and bile all at once. Like the weight of us remade of dust and gradually blown away at rates depending on the wind. We are not our desire, 
but the places we move through to satisfy it. For me, it's meant carving myself into being enough for the desires of another and you. That conflict of masculinity itself, a conflict of masculinity and femininity. Elsewhere entities grabbing at the breath we leave behind. You're there as I draw out a new life, nib to nib, two spirals closing inwards like our shared prognosis. Push and give of indefinite time, the ignorance to resent what we would eventually turn into. If our fragments settle along the breeze, maybe we'd be patched back together. Till then, I can be my own daddy. And something a bit lighter. <laughs> so, this poem is... I thought I'd read this... I wasn't sure what second poem I'd read today, but because it's such a nice day, and I've come through from London to Hastings today, and it feels like a bit of a mini-holiday, I'm going to read a poem about a, lad's a ridiculous lad's holiday that I went on when I was 17 um, to Crete um, 10 years ago. Uh, this is 2K12. 2K12. Bread a haunting on the Mediterranean. 12 of the whitest boys you ever did see, practically see through. The fainter the figure, the louder his shriek of epidermis and red-hot intentions never actualised. Burdened with testosterone, I played hetero as a bisexual, blackout intimacies with mistaken mouths, the curb a rank cushion of regurgitated denial. Everything your adolescence has led up to, right? Top heavy exchanges of skin and bravado at all times six inches from, a, from an obscene six pack, my disco fleshiness amplified to ear splitting. The number of dicks plucked out and wiggled around for a banter of straight eyes. By fortnight's end, we were pulled from the sea with new chins, nevertheless drowning in hormones and a dread not yet medicated, the kind you could drink through. I vomit from the bent of the bottom bunk and a cockroach paddles in it, gay as you like. Didn't that holiday turn us all? Thank you. <laughs> femininity and masculinity in your latest novel, Marta Marta, and you had a, an amazing three-day launch event um, to kind of celebrate your book and also have events each around the themes that are in Marta Marta. So could you tell us a bit about this new novel that just came out and about the themes <coughs> that you were exploring um, within it? Mm -hmm. oh. um, three years ago, I started thinking about a new novel and the only thing I knew was that it was going to be about two old women um, two old women who Maltese women uh, who are in their 80s but um, who decided not to become one of two possibilities uh, either becoming nuns or becoming wives um, which was a, which was something that they would normally have to choose um, when they were younger. I mean, Malta uh, in the forties, fifties, it was a very, very conservative. So I wanted to explore. In the beginning, I did not know I wanted to explore this, but eventually, this led to a realization that 
there are no novels in Maltese that explore um, feminist aspects or um, feminist ideas, or even novels that question uh, the, the, these things. So it led to, um, to a research process. Um, so little by little, what came about was this story um, told in five voices about these characters living in the same house and this, this house is somewhere in Malta and um, uh, these characters that live there most of them women uh, are of different ages and each one is living their own um, feminist struggle or struggle against some form of oppression but obviously what is different is that they are of different ages and eventually I realized that if feminism never really uh, was an issue in Malta, I mean nobody, there, there are no f feminist activists in, when I was growing up, there were, there were none and um, it's only now that I can see that uh, the younger generation is questioning a lot about the um, patriarchal oppression that still exists in our country. So I wanted to write something uh, which gives a historic idea of why we have this oppressive um, uh, situation in Malta. I wanted to focus on the uh, the hold that the Catholic religion has in our country, which is probably the reason why, I mean, so many people are still um, tied to the Catholic religion. They might not go to church every day, but um, they, still, uh, they still think in that way, and certain decisions are still taken because they were brought up as Catholic. Uh, one very hot issue at the moment is abortion. Um, so I wanted to tackle that and I wanted to present the idea that the reason why abortion is still illegal in our country is because of the hold of the Catholic religion. That is one of the major reasons. So this novel explores all these things. What, there is a, another aspect and this um, it focuses also on the gender issue, not just from a feminist point of view, but also from a binary and non-binary point of view, So, be, because they are related. I mean, they, it's, it, obviously, it's um, um, the, the feminist fight against the patriarchy is uh, about um, the heteronormative ideology um, that uh, a conservative and the Catholic country um, considers as normal. So obviously the, these, these oppressions are all dealing with the same um, oppressive force. Um, yeah, so when, when, when I had almost finished the novel, I knew that um, the things that I was going to present uh, might not be uh, kindly taken by everyone. So I wanted to uh, I wanted to make sure that um, um, I'm on the right track with everyone. So I asked um, seven different people. One of them was Kat uh, to read the manuscript. There was one who is a, a lawyer um, researching the possibility of abortion in Malta. There's a gynecologist who works in a gender clinic. Uh, someone who is um, a lecturer at university um, specializing in uh, gender archaeology, um, uh, racial, who also uh, teaches uh, at the university feminist literature. So I try to find, uh, get this, uh, like the, the support of all these people. And they read the novel, gave me the feedback, and they enjoyed it. <laughs> that was really yeah so I
that one, I, that I needed that because uh, I wanted to make sure that I am not uh, that I am on the right track in all these aspects. Uh, so much so that um, one thing that that uh, this novel Marta Marta uh, promotes is the idea of community collaboration, uh, plurality, diversity, working together uh, with uh, respecting one another, solidarity. And what resulted is that a little community um, was born out of this collaboration. Uh, so the three-day book launch, it was, it was amazing. Um, uh, the, the, the same people who read the, the novel were the people who uh, took part in the book launch. Uh, there were very interesting talks. Um, they're on YouTube if you want to listen to them. There are <laughs> some, half of them in English, half of them in Maltese. Um, so yeah, I was very, very happy. And uh, it, it's a very, very strong novel because of this, this the strength that came from this collaboration that I am writing about, but I'm also living through this novel. So I'm very happy with it. Amazing, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> um, before we open up for questions, um, Kat, we have two more books coming out in November. We do. Even though we didn't have a record for publishing the first two. Um, <laughs> but could you just tell us what they will be, uh, what we can look forward to in November? Yeah. Uh, so we're doing Sintelos 2, um, we've had lots of great submissions, it's a very different collection to different names, different, different submissions, uh, longer poems, two very long poems, some non-fiction this time which is really great, um, so we're really looking forward to pulling that together and um, yeah, um, that will come out in November. And we're also um, working on a translation. Um, we're working with uh, we're working on a book called currently called Castillo in Maltese. It's being translated by Albert Gatt. Um, it's a kind of meta detective novel with it's a book within a book, um, slightly different to Laurent's book in every, every single way. It's a bigger novel. It's a slightly more um, yeah plot driven, I suppose, um, offering. And uh, we haven't decided on the title yet. Uh, we're working with the translator at the moment, and that should also be coming out in November. Yes, by Claire at the party. By Claire at the party. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, let's open up for questions. Yes. I think we've got time for a couple. Um, but yeah, has anyone got a question for anybody, Laurent, Peter, or Kat? Yeah. Thank you, first of all, very much. That was incredible and very interesting. Um, just thinking about, uh, well, first of all, there's very little translation um, into English, so it's brilliant that you're taking that charge when you compare it to how much um, is translated from English into other countries, so that's brilliant. And just thinking about, um, I can't, I think it was Lowell that said it, and he talked very much about making sure when you're translating not to lose too much of the foreignness and not to foreignize it too much and so I just wondered about the balancing and any challenges you had in making it palatable to the English reader without losing the essences of the Maltese. So that's a really great question because it's something that Jen and I and Lorraine actually mm -hmm. discussed quite a lot. Um, I think if you see the book we made um, quite a big effort not to flatten it in any way, so um, we have uh, retained the Maltese you know, title inside. We've also kept um, the Maltese titles, so, um, so the translation there. So, um, And then another decision we made was to retain some Maltese words also. Where we sorry, felt, sorry, some, also to retain some Maltese words um, within the text where we felt like it didn't need to be particularly um, described and I think um, yeah that's been a conscious decision that we've made I think something to add though um, is that we have sort of almost the privilege of, of Jen, Jen and I kind of coming from two I guess different linguistic backgrounds in, in, in a sense and I think that has really helped us to kind of balance out those decisions a little bit as well and to kind of query them but we were all involved, I think, mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. making that decision, and our conscious effort, I think, is to is to not not to kind of um, overemphasize that, but 
it, it feels really important to us that Maltese is kind of is represented in in every sense. And for, for me, Maltese is but it's bi, we are bilingual largely, and so those two languages do sit together and should sit together somehow. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. Mm -hmm. No, I think yeah, what you say, I think because um, that that urge of like domestication versus foreignization, I think. Um, so I translate from German. I translate German literature, and what I'm always banging on about is it's really all about what surrounds the the book. So, for instance, announcing the print on the cover it's a translation is very important. You know, not hiding that it's a translation. As Kat says, you're constantly reminded in little ways that what you're reading is not an English book because of the use of Maltese words. And I think, um, you know, my, my approach is always that you're just, you're telling someone else a story. So it's all about the story. Um, you know, it's not a way of teaching somebody Maltese. It's, it's first and foremost um, for somebody sitting at home or on the bus reading a, a story. So... But it's um, one of the most fascinating questions around being a translator. And sometimes I find myself translating from German and then read it back and think, this is a very German sentence I've created in English, <laughs> which is like maybe that perfect thing where you can see both. But um, I've hijacked the panel. Uh, has anyone got a question? <laughs> but, um, yeah, anyone else? Back on. Oh, Charlie, yeah. Um, I just wondered if you could say something about what the reception has been in Malta. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were asked this um, yeah, earlier this week and the straightforward answer is we're, we're kind of still in shock about how amazing the response has been because our aim was to publish in the UK or in the kind of anglophone world and um, that's where we were looking, you know, we're producing books so that English speakers can read Maltese literature. But then we kind of mysteriously forgot that Malta is a bilingual country and that um, what, what it's resulted in is the, the response and the need for the books was massive. You know, we sold out after doing an event at the book festival instantly. All the books we brought, they just went. And... Um, what, what has been nice is it's it's not only people who are preferring to read in English, people have then been buying Laurent's book in the original because they want to read both. Mm -hmm. um, so we're really overwhelmed by, you know, the bookshops have been amazing. There's amazing independent bookshops that have also been so supportive and, you know, almost too supportive because our capacity is so small. <laughs> um, we both have full-time jobs on, on top of doing the press that it's almost like, it's quite painful sometimes to see how much enthusiasm there is and we can't almost keep up. Mm. But um, we're trying to find ways around um, getting that supply out there. But yeah, it's been really amazing. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you want to add anything about, um, yeah, that maybe, about the younger generation maybe. Yeah. Um, what's been really interesting is um, that it seems to have landed a lot with, with the younger generation and something that we've been kind of hopeful of is that this might also start a few more or inspire a few more people who are actually based in Malta to potentially um, start their own publishing as well and to, to potentially um, publish the Maltese writing that isn't being published because that's not something that we can accommodate at the moment but we've contacted a lot and this has sort of sparked a lot of that the anthology sort of it, our call for submissions seems to spark quite a bit of that and lots of queries about about how people can get published and who can publish and I think um, that's been really nice to see because it feels like it's kind of started something a little bit or, or and that's really what we've wanted to do is kind of poke at it a little bit and say Publishing in Malta is just, it's kind of an institution that doesn't feel very alive um, and it's it, its kind of brought some life back to it a little bit, there's more conversation, so that's been a really nice aspect of it actually, being able to talk to people and it's sort of a younger, a younger audience coming forward to say, you know, this is something they'd like to do potentially. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe one more question, if anybody... Has any burning questions that for anyone <laughs> about anything? <laughs>
translation um, competition, no? Yeah, so, oh yeah, that's one thing um, we can tell you about is we have started a translation prize because um, there are currently so few established or even emerging literary translators from Maltese, which is why Kat translated our first <laughs> book. Um, we opened a translation prize which closes on Sunday where we're hoping to find the, a whole new generation of, of translators from Maltese um, and the top five or six submissions we're going to be doing a, a translation workshop and then the winner will be published in the anthology. So we've set um, a short excerpt from the last um, National Book Prize winning novel. Um, so again, hopefully Kat won't have to translate all the books <laughs> or, um, or Albert Gat who is translating our current book. Um, but yeah, a big thing is maybe eventually we'll be able to help train and also feed uh, Maltese writers into the UK publishing scene so we won't have to publish everyone. And maybe the dream is we won't have to exist because all the publishers <laughs> will be publishing Maltese writers. But um, yeah, thank you so much um, for joining us this evening. We're really overwhelmed by this response. So thank you for celebrating with us. Do stick around. Um, and have a drink and chat to everyone, but I'd really like to thank Peter, Loran and Kat, mm -hmm. um, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.